welcome to the coaching studio. I am so privileged today to have Otto Siegel as my guest, and I'd like to read you a little bit about him. Otto is the founder and owner, CEO of Genius Coaching in Scottsdale, Arizona. He works with brilliant misfits from seven to 27 and their families to help them find out who they really are and overcome behavioral and emotional challenges. He is the co-author of Yes, You Are a Genius and created the Genius Profile as an assessment system to evaluate human brilliance. Otto's approach is informed by his 17 plus years as a high school teacher in Munich and in Sao Paulo, and based on principles of brain plasticity, the physiology of the human body, positive psychology, educational kinesiology, and behavioral science. He holds a master's degree in education from the University of Munich and is a master certified coach with the International Coach Federation. So Otto, welcome, 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 welcome to the coaching studio. Thank you so much for being here today. I, I am really curious about your book. I actually have a quick review that I, I sort of parsed out of the review of your book. And I, I was wondering if I could read that real quickly. Absolutely. My pleasure to be on your radio show. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so this is a great review of Yes, You Are a Genius by Otto Siegel and Susanna Lang. Siegel and Lang offer as their initial evidence Einstein's oft stated belief, there is a genius in everyone. They make a strong case for their argument. They pose three questions to their reader. What is my unique set of genius abilities? Which environment brings them out? And how and where can I intentionally leverage them? Genius becomes an uplifting lesson on the how-tos of learning and living, offering a clarifying and systemic approach to self-enhancement. To paraphrase the wise old axiom, genius is a terrible thing to waste. And this is a sort of a, a breakdown of a review by Ben Miles of North Valley Magazine in Phoenix, Arizona. So it sounds like a fabulous book. Um, I, I have not read it yet, but I am definitely uh, heading that direction. I love the premise of it, which really rolls into my first question for you. What where did you discover your own genius? Like, how did you take that journey of self-discovery of your own genius? Well, more likely than expected, it was a painful way to do that. <laughs> I was always the highly intelligent misfit. Already in elementary school, I just never fit in. I'd never fit in any classroom. I only had a few friends. I felt lonely most of the time, but then I had these brilliant outbursts. I could memorize things and nobody else would say, how did this come out of you? And I could make people just look at me and say, wow, I didn't know you knew that. And I felt alienated for a long time until I realized, hey, wait a minute. No, no, that's my brilliance. I strive when I did unusual things. So for example, in puberty, I grew very fast all of a sudden. And then my, my body felt awkward and I just didn't feel any comfortable anymore. And I had a brilliant PE teacher and he told me, you need to move more. Come here, play volleyball, play basketball, do track and field, and he invited me to additional uh, extracurricular activities, and I did. It saved me from childhood or teenage depression. That's what the first light bulb that came on in me and said, well, there's a strong connection between physical movement, do what you love to do, and do it abundantly, go all out. And sure enough, I qualified for Olympic Games in Mexico City. How about that? Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> It was outlier. <laughs> and I felt in my element, okay, when I do this outrageous thing. Then again, the routine kicks in. Yes, you go to the motions. Uh, and I injured myself. I couldn't study physical education. I had a back injury right before entry exam to university. So that was a no go. Big stop sign right there. Big personal crisis with it, of course. Then I go to the motions of university, study biology and chemistry. I'm so glad I did. The decision for that I made during the opera in the break while I was eating ice cream and hot strawberries out of the blue because I had teachers that were my role model. Mm -hmm. They saw a professor that saw beyond their discipline. They saw the big picture of biology that every person needs to know the basics about the human body. If you are biologist or not, you need to know how digestion works. Not only if it's sick, you give responsibility to a doctor. No, that's not good enough. And the same thing I met in chemistry. And that resonated with me. Even though I was mediocre, I had a C in, in both. 
in the high school. But this was my calling. Until today, I'm passionate about the human body. It's the foundation of genius coaching is physical intelligence. Genius is not mental. Genius is an experience. Mm -hmm. All of them, if you started them, they're outliers. All of them. If it's Bill Gates, if it's Steve Jobs, you name it. All of them stepped out of something. It was not comfortable. They were frequently misunderstood and frequently ma didn't make it. That's why genius is so suppressed. People just don't have the guts to, to live it and find out what it is. So it took me 40 years to figure it out. I'm wondering, you know, as I'm hearing you talk and I'm really having that sense of the, the kinesiology, the physicality, the somatic experiencing that you're talking about, how, do you, how did you come into coaching from this experience? Yeah, there was another story. When I moved here to the United States, teaching was out because I was done with it after 17 years in uh, Munich and in Brazil, and I couldn't stand the routine anymore. So I got a job in a, in a corporation as a training manager. And one of my job was to develop training. And I had no idea how to do it, but I came across coaching. One morning, the coaching brochure was on my, on my desk. And I thought, that's it. If we train <laughs> teachers to be coaches, we are all good. My progressive CEO said, yes, go for it. I had a chance not only get paid for the certification, the first part with the ICF, but also to develop coaching as a leadership tool right away. And that was absolutely, it was in heaven for me because I love to learn and to teach at the same time. That's how I got into coaching because I saw the results. I said, wow, that's good. And after they laid me off, after the company was sold, uh, I took my severance package and started, okay, now I need to merge those two, education and coaching, because it's all behavior driven. It's not the right system only. The kids need to have to want to learn. They need to be excited about learning, open their mind, not being bored out of their mind, be excited and curious. That fuels learning like nothing else. And that's how I started in 2003. Amazing. Wow. That's a, quite a journey you've been on. When you think about, you know, where you have been and all the things that you've been through as on this evolution of yourself towards becoming a genius coach, what have you most learned about yourself along the way? that I cannot compromise with who I am. I cannot. If I do, I get depressed. And I went through a severe bout of depression anyway. In my, in my 40s, it was definitely a severe mid -life, uh, midlife crisis. But once I'm true to myself, I know what it is. I've had enough coaching myself and workshops to figure that out. Right. If I'm true to that, I'm happy. Yeah. I create money. I create my life. I smile all the time. I inspire other people. I'm contagious with my energy. And that's what I learned, but only if I'm true to myself. Yeah. And for a lot of people that being true to themselves is theoretically makes sense, but, but to embody that is something different. Any words of wisdom on how to build that muscle of being true to oneself? Hire a coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah have that partnership uh, absolutely impossible to do it on your own absolutely impossible i have a coach on a consistent basis because it's an ongoing adventure it's it's fun to do that because there's always more to discover yeah you know, and I think that is so crucial, Otto, because I think a lot of, you know, it's an interesting thing. There are a lot of coaches in the world and they're, they're you know, want to be of value to their clients and they're out there selling themselves as coaches and yet they don't themselves have a coach. It is a really interesting paradox that yeah. exists in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so how do you keep this passion alive in yourself? I mean, I, I hear the part about the alignment to your true self, but how do you keep that energy up and that align and that passion? By always doing new things. I'm an innovator. Okay, as I'm not a life coach, I'm not a business coach, I'm not an executive coach, I'm a genius coach. Mm -hmm. And that is my niche by choice because it's rooted in myself. I cannot do anything else. Yes, I coach executives, of course, because highly intelligent misfits are everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they have no age limits. I even do longevity coaching. Because if you come to retirement, the, the, the idea, the, the reality now that shows up more and more in the longevity trend globally is you can push your age limit. Mm -hmm. And that's for many people frightening, others it's exciting because genius doesn't stop. 
So speak to that. What when you hear it's frightening to somebody versus exciting, what is the what is the tension between those two perspectives for folks? Most people are deeply ingrained in the whole thing, life and death cycle. Okay, they might stretch it a little bit. I'm thankful I live a little bit longer than my dad did, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. Now, for the first time in human history, we have a technology available, we have scientific insights available that no generation ever had before us. Right. And that gives us enough reason to question the normal life and death cycle. I do, and I'm totally intrigued about it because it's so much fun to live longer. I want to have so much fun, I forget to die. <laughs> <laughs> have so much fun I forget to die also and you know and I, and I the thing that shows up for me as you're saying that is really this idea these stories that we create about like okay I'm going to work this long at this one company and then I'll retire and then I'll be retired and then I'll have all this time to whatever sit in the sun take long walks play golf whatever your vision is and and it's interesting because as I'm hearing you talk I'm thinking about myself and I think you know, I don't, I don't want to retire. Like retirement isn't a word that comes up in my mind because I like what I do so much. The idea, I may like shift the, the amount of time I spend in different places, but I really love this idea of keeping my mind alive. Right. And that's what yeah. I'm talking about also. Yeah, absolutely. What is something that you, you mean? Keep... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, it's everything to round that out. It's everything in life. It's mind, body, spirit, everything. Because you, without your body, you cannot have a mind that's functioning. So it's all one. And the whole holistic uh, approach in coaching, I totally intrigued about it. Also, I like the new trend in somatic coaching. Finally, coaches wake up that the body is everything, including the brain. The brain is not a separate entity. It's not neurological coaching only. That's still mind over body. The yeah. new paradigm is mind and body. How about that? <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, that sense that, you know, I mean, our first brain really was our gut when you think back on it, even yeah. an amoeba has a gut. Um, and so it, it's like the sense of like engaging all your brains in, in the processing. I mean, we know about the head, heart, gut connection. I think as science continues to move forward with curiosity, we're going to find that all of our different organs probably are impacting in the way that we think and feel and experience the world around us. Absolutely. It is a whole body experience. You know, it's interesting. This is kind of an aside, but I saw this amazing 3D resonance uh, image of a cell. It's like the highest resonance of a cell photo ever taken. Mm -hmm. And you look at it and I'll show a picture of it in here. In fact, I'll share it with you in just a second. Um, but it is like looking at an entire universe. Let me universe. actually pull that up real quickly. I would love to see that picture. It's fabulous. It I love it. And I love what you say. The amoeba has already a gut. It's our first brain. I love it. It's so right on. We all have it backwards. <laughs> and we really, we have really taken, we've really taken this idea of the mind as the most important structure a bit seriously. So, yeah. so Otto, let me share this with you really quickly. I think you're going to be blown away. Wow. Yeah. So this is the most detailed representation of a human cell. Yeah. I mean, and, and when I looked at it, I was like, it's extraordinary for the fact that it's so complex. It's a universe. It is a universe. The similarity, it, to, yeah, similarity of the universe is absolutely stunning. And if, and if this is what is, we are at the cellular level. Yeah. It just is striking what wow. all we probably don't even know yet. <laughs> Do you know how many cells we have sitting on our chairs? No, but I think you do because you're asking this question. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to let you guess, but I don't know if I should. <laughs> I'm sure it's in the billions. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll be off. <laughs> 100 trillion. 100 trillion. Ironically, the stars in the visible universe have the same number. Interesting. So Interesting. If I have a very spiritual client and she talks to me about the universe, the universe gave me this, the universe gave me that today. I said, hey, wait a minute, which one do you mean? This one out there or this one sitting on your chair? This one right here. That one is sitting on your chair, I can coach, definitely. The other one, I'm not sure about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. 
And now that we even see the cell, like there's a billion or maybe even a trillion, you, how many cells in the human body? A trillion. A hundred trillion universes within us yeah. on top of the, oh, extraordinary. Thank you. Well, now I know how I'm going to keep my passion alive is thinking about these, like, forget about the multiverse. We are the multiverse. Um, I love this word. Beautiful, Lisa. Yeah. What is your, what do you think the biggest misconception about coaching is that you see in, in the world? Mind over body is a misconception and not giving the body enough credit and in the coaching process because the body is the one taking action. The mind alone doesn't do anything. The mind just develops strategies and plans and it develops feelings and emotions in the limbic system. They're processed. We know so much about it now, but the person taking action is the rest of it. Yeah. And that to come that to the forefront, call it somatic coaching, I call it genius coaching. That is genius because genius is physical. Genius is biological. All these people who did something, did something. They don't just thinking about it. They did something significant. And that's, you need the whole body, whole person. So my background is pure biology and physiology and brain plasticity. We can re-educate our brains. That's my new trend in coaching. Re-educating the brain with our reality. Not with fantasies, not even with goals. Goals are okay, but they're limited. And they're temporary because they change over time. Right. So as a much bigger picture for coaching, I, I can see. That's beautiful. And I heard you talk about, um, well, actually, before I ask that question, what do you think is something that young coaches need to understand as they're going through their own coaching journey that would be useful as they, they move from whether it's a, a new student towards their MCC? What do you think? new coaches and young coaches might benefit from hearing from you? Uh, the structure of coaching, the basic assumption of coaching is absolutely valuable to bridge the gap between the, the insights and knowledge, the wisdom and the action. Mm -hmm. And to understand that on a deep level, it's very important for a growing coach, unfolding coach, because it's never ending journey. Once you understand, it's great what you think, but how about the action? And what's in between? What are the barriers do we make up? I call it MUS, made up stuff. Mm -hmm. I call it stories. So there you go. Internal narratives, go. right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, yeah. And, and as you say that, you know, the thing that is, I mean, I know in my own coaching journey, the letting go of the attachment to what I knew in, in service of asking questions that supported my clients to know what they knew. Yeah. Right. And so I hear that in what you're talking about, like, how do we do that as coaches support our clients to bring out that internal wisdom that they already embody yeah. unconsciously, possibly. Absolutely. Most of the time, that's why they hire us. And also how to hold that space, what we see almost immediately, and they might be totally blind to because it's on their back. We see their back and they don't. So this kind of building trust and building a deep respect for each client is such an amazing journey that has to do with personal maturity as well. And that's what I love about coaching, but there's no end to this journey. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody asked me, oh, you got your MCC. And I was like, it's really much more of a mile marker in my mind than it is an end goal. Like it's really just another, it's an indicator that, okay, I be, I'm able to demonstrate like this, but that's no stopping point. Like the journey continues to your point. Exactly. So how do you take care of yourself as a person so that you can show up so fully with your clients, like embodying your own coaching mindset? What, what strategies do you utilize? Well, first is the lifestyle. Um, my, my day begins with the body hour. First 20 minutes are dedicated to our dogs. I run with them. <laughs> then I include either uh, yoga, I include swimming, I include a, a strength workout, I include stretching, just to welcome my body to this new day. And then I go out and do things. And there's a very good habits. I eat healthy food. I eat a very delicious diet, not even a diet. I don't even like it because I like food. It has to be tasty and healthy, as fresh as possible, organic as possible, because that builds my cells and I care about them. That's self-love in many, many different ways. 
I have very good friends that uh, build my life. I have a very great circle of friends, a great community called People Unlimited that build my life to endlessly, which means to take out death from the equation. That is very refreshing to do that. So the whole lifestyle is evolving around that. Yeah, and it's so crucial, those people that we surround ourselves with, we are at choice. And if we choose consciously the folks that we surround ourselves with who uplift us along the way, and yeah. we uplift them, what a what a reciprocity. You know, the self-love in the multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> So what are you up to today that you would like to share with this audience? Uh, today, I'm working on my new campaign for a program I call, uh, it came out of COVID called Parent Playtime. Oh, I, figured out, I figured out in my work with teenagers, especially parents don't play with their kids anymore. They just dictate them. And who wants to hear that all day long as a child? Of course, you shut down. You don't trust them. You don't listen anymore because it's just too much. Mm -hmm. So we started to, I started to do a research, a survey, and sure enough, parents said, I don't even know how to play with my child. Okay, you have a play disorder. How about that? You want to heal it? So I, I started a pilot program. That's diagnosable months. too, a play disorder. Play disorder. <laughs> my latest diagnosis, do you suffer from play disorder? Because if you think about it, play is the first language you speak without having to learn it mm -hmm. internationally. Play doesn't do any discrimination. Play doesn't care about skin color. Play doesn't care about sex and gender, nothing. It doesn't even care about species. If you watch any animal on the planet, play. <laughs> exactly. And kids play with dogs. I mean, it goes even across- across, yeah, across species, yeah. So it is so powerful. I put parents in breakout session on Zoom, bring, have them bring a toy and play with each other, strangers they never met. It is absolutely mind blowing to say the least. And now I developed this program for parents to play, parent playtime, the biggest stress relief you can imagine. I love it. Uh, well, and there'll definitely be a link below the, the podcast so mm -hmm. that you can follow the link and learn more about parents playtime. Uh, you know, it's so interesting because that idea of laughter and how often kids laugh versus how often adults laughed, right? And, and this idea of play, I think we get so serious and bogged down with all of the stories around responsibility and how we're supposed to represent ourselves, whether yes. it's to the world, to ourselves, to our spouse, to our children, whoever, right? And, and these, these roles that we get involved in playing often don't allow us outside the box. So true, so true. And all these things are curable. Yes. But they're I very, guess. very strong. <laughs> <laughs> so there's more than hope, Lisa. <laughs> there is. There's so much hope. And play means so many different things to different people, but finding what it means to you and doing it, to your exactly. point, it's an action, right? It's yeah. that taking that action and not yeah. just thinking about it. It's not exactly. all in our head. It's actually all about us, inside of us. Yeah. Otto, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really am so thankful I had this opportunity to have this conversation with you. Thank you, Lisa. I feel the same. It was such a refreshing, energizing conversation. I love it. I love to share with who I am. I love to learn about you. And thank you for doing this podcast. It's an amazing communication tool. It was an honor to be invited for you, by you today. Thank you so much. You are so welcome. And to our, the listeners, please, th there are links below that'll take you to Otto's book. And there are links below that'll take you to his website so you can learn more about the work that he is doing in the world and find ways to enliven yourself and your whole self in your multiverse that is you. So I'm in a, I'm living with that multiverse now of self-love in the multiverse. Uh, that's my new favorite thing. <laughs> so thank you so much. Mm -hmm.